Ah, uh, Halloween. Really, little sleep was had and I feel completely drained come morning. Even when Hana rises from bed, in spite of a mild fever and invites me down to breakfast, I can't be bothered to drag myself out from the comfort of the sheets. A mild fever, huh? It's not like I need to do something particularly important today. The rain that has started sometime during the night doesn't help the mood. Okay, maybe it helps just a little. The strange sunny weather has been nice and all, but for it to return as it should be feels like a good sign of things to come. Perhaps things will settle back to normal and the crazy drama that has gone on lately will die down. The rhythmic pitter-patter of the rain fills the early morning silence with a steady beat. Thank goodness I don't have to be anywhere in a hurry today. I would hate to be caught unawares in this rain. With how it looks outside, it seems that the weather is making up for all the sunny days it has given us with a good old-fashioned downpour. It does let up within the quarter of an hour. However, a day beginning with cloudbursts like this? Locals usually take it as an immediate sign. Luxburn's abysmal weather is back, likely for good. I'll be listening to the rainfall outside your window when you're in bed. Delightful. I hope they did a damn good job of fixing this place, because I'd rather not have to deal with leaky roofs. Though Hana might find humor in it, and perhaps ask me to sing in the rain to wear out my anger, I don't like the idea that the realty did a horrid patch job with the place. We, well, Hana technically, paid millions for this place. It better live up to the price the realty company sold it for. Not that it's something she should be fretting about at the moment when her health's not at its best. Hana is going to be brought to the hospital for a checkup today, and if anything, I prefer that she focus on getting better. That fever, no matter how slight it is, can't be good for unborn children after all. Perhaps a proper rest is all she needs, but I'd rather not assume things. I'm a businessman, not a doctor. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Wonder of wonders why I even bother agreeing to babysitting duty at that. But here I am, scheduled as today's babysitter for Suarez's brat once her father drops her off at the mansion steps. Kylie! Can't wait to see you possessed again. Though that is a worry for much, much later. If I wish to, I can ask that nobody bother me while I doze off in a cocoon of comforters. But as always, somebody has to be a buzzkill. Are you really going to stay in bed all day? Sue me. What do you want? It's far too early to deal with your nosiness. You must have been really rattled by what happened yesterday. If you need to talk about it, I am quite qualified in that regard. Dang, therapist too. And you aren't even the slightest bit bothered. Truly. Not even the slightest bit worried. I was worried. But I realized that it's not my life in danger, is it? Oh, ha ha. My worrying will not help matters. Neither will yours. Loath as I am to admit it, he is right. The whole thing might have rattled me, but there's little point in jumping at every shadow I see from the corner of my eye. I shouldn't lose my head for a threat that might not even come. I should know better by now. But I've never been this worried about a possible threat on my life before. I'll be honest here. If anyone is in danger, it's Hana. I can take care of myself just fine. With security tightened, I'll have at least one guard, if not five, making sure nobody gets within ten feet from me without my say-so. Hana, on the other hand, is pregnant and will be away for most of the day. It is a small relief that Johans will be with her. Nice. Are there any updates about the woman? <laughs> the woman. Being in the dark has me on edge. Information, any at all, may very well help me in calming down. I've already briefed security about her. And more from the agency will be arriving tonight. But they haven't seen anyone fitting the description. Hmm. So you have nothing, then? Hmm, fat lot of use you guys are. What do I even pay you for? Do me a favor. There's the door. Don't let it hit you on your way out. Well, there is something. It's about McCulloch. Hmm. Can anyone blame me if I show the tiniest bit of interest? She's still not done with the house. And she's a nice enough woman. Plans to go back to sleep are gone. I called her secretary about taking the day off. He hasn't heard from her over the weekend. She's down below. She's probably passed out after enjoying a pint or two or ten in a bar somewhere. She's an adult. It was the weekend. She's allowed to disappear and not think about work. Fuck. <laughs> 
I wish I was passed out after a night of drinking. He does know that mobiles are a thing. Not for McCullough. That's all well and good, but she's not answering her mobile either. Not that she would at the best of times. Mr. Parker will be filling a missing persons case with the police if she doesn't turn up today. That's trouble for us, because the last place she was seen was here. Don't want the police snooping around in our affairs. Certainly someone must know where she is. Tabs are kept without fail on people who come to work with me. Background checks and constant surveillance until they finish their contracts with the rights. Some would say that it's all a bit over the top. But I can't be too safe. Too many want me dead. What about one of ours? Has anyone seen her? She's pretty hard to miss with how tall the woman is. <laughs> the last anyone has seen of her was here. The morning of the party. Your housewarming party. That isn't good news. <sighs> it wouldn't do for the police to hear of this and to suspect. I don't know why, but the noise Luke just made there made me think of Bugs Bunny eating a carrot. <laughs> it's of little import that I can easily prove my innocence. It is all a matter of principle. Because even the accusation of misdemeanor should not stain my reputation. Although, maybe it is a bit too late to hope for a squeaky clean one. Besides, it'll be such a hassle to have police poking about the house looking for a body that doesn't exist, thankfully. Now, if we're done here, I'd like to go back to sleep and... Yo, Luke? Yo, Luke? Where are you? Oh, boy. Well, there goes. Any plans of grabbing some shut-eye? Rolling over on my stomach, I can only scream into my pillow. I never related more to a character. Of course, of course. Ugh. Mm-hmm. You always your Johans, distract her. Oh, look, it's time for me to go. Johans, why? Have fun with your little play date. So long, farewell, and auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye. <laughs> No, Johans, don't you turn away from me. Keep her busy for an hour. Come on! <laughs> Come on! I have to press my face against the pillow once more to suppress a groan. You just can't get loyal help anymore. Hello there, little Fraulein. Your uncle is just upstairs and will be down in a moment. He is super excited to have you today. I hope you're well rested and ready to play a lot. Dang. That bastard. <laughs> he got me. I'll be down in a sec, munchkin. Let me just... <laughs> munchkin? Change into a fresh shirt. Brush my teeth. Fix my hair. Bemoan my very existence. Wish I was anywhere else in the world right now. Don't get me wrong. Kylie is a great kid. Wonderful. Better than most brats her age. But handling a tyke is the last thing I want on my agenda right now with this whole Hana business. Fortunately, I am well-versed in how the world works. I've long learned that the show must go on, no matter what hurdles come in my way. So I set to preparing for the day. Running a comb through my hair is just divine and simply makes me feel more human. Bed hair is disgusting, though it isn't as bad now as it was when I was a child. With how expensive a trip to the barber's was, I often had to grow it out until Mother had the time to cut it for me. The curls and tangles were simply horrid, why, I was even mistaken as a little girl because of that. It certainly doesn't help that I was named Lucille. A freshly pressed shirt is enough to chase away the last signs of sleepiness. The feel of crisp and clean cloth in my hands is a clear marker to the start of the day. Smoothing down my suit and my hair with a sigh, I steal myself for the horrors. Wink. The horrors that come with taking care of a child. Ah. Good morning to you, Luke. Good morning, Kylie. Speak of the devil and she shall appear. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, Kylie grins up at me as soon as I open the bedroom door. She swings the backpack she's clutching, hitting my leg in a show of impatience and looking entirely unapologetic for it. Did you just wake up? Don't tell me you forgot. Our lady today. I doubt I'd forget. Kylie's visits are a frequent enough thing that they found a way into my schedule. They're supposed to be visits to her godmother, but we can't pick who a child gets along with. So long as I'm not busy, her father can drop her off for the day. 
Which is all well and good for me if it makes Suarez focus on work I've given him. Besides, she's a bright child. Tolerable. Kid's got a good head on her shoulders and can get pretty mature for her age at times. Of course, they have to thank me for that. Her parents can take partial credit, but Hana and I have been there for this kid since she was just a small babe. Why, I can still remember the first time I saw her. It was during her baptism. The only reason I was there was to accompany Hana, who was to be named Godmother. She was such a tiny thing, not even a year old and swaddled in her mother's arm in white cloth. It was the first time I really saw an infant up close. Close enough to hold one, at least. It had been terrifying to be given a little child to carry after the whole water ceremony. I'd never done so before that, to hold a tiny life in my arms. It's one of the most terrifying feelings. I could have just dropped her on her head, and this little tyke before me would have stopped existing then and there. It's basically the thought that goes through my head every time I hold a small child. But the child just smiled at me, babbling nonsensical words as children do, and clinging to me even as I tried to hand her off to Hana. She had thought it hilarious and adorable. My suit had been a mess, and I was nearly an anxious wreck by the time I handed her back to her mother. Yet, it was pleasant, too. To think. To think I might be doing it again soon. With Hana's children. With our children. Kids of my own flesh and blood. In a few months' time, I'll be cradling them in my arms, hearing the ring of their laughters against my ears. It's... It's a tender thing to think about. And despite myself, in spite of all the fears that I will never be good enough for them, I'm... I'm actually looking forward to it. Luke, there is hope for you after all. Of course I didn't, you little rugrat. I just had to take care of something before you arrived. I also had to have a very long inner monologue about babies <laughs> before I answered you. Really? Well, I guess that's fine. As long as he told me for work like last time. Really? Now why don't we go back down and have breakfast in the parlor? I already eat at home! Papa made one of his tortillas de patatas! He wouldn't let me leave until I finished every bite. Tortilla, huh? Not tortilla? Ah, the Suarez's infamous tortilla de patatas. Those things are a hazard. That would be very filling. You can probably use one to bludgeon someone into submission with how huge they are. It's a miracle Kylie can still be so energetic. I had trouble staying awake the first time I had one. Speaking of staying awake. Well, I need some coffee in me at the very least. But if you'd like, you can jump straight to dessert. Yes! Dessert, please! It's easy enough to manage Kylie with the promise of sweets, thankfully. The hard part is managing her before she gets the sweets. Because I nearly have a heart attack when the kid races down the stairs. Just the thought of her slipping and breaking her neck is enough to make me rush down after her. Oh, slow down! The food isn't going anywhere! The food is going somewhere! In my tummy! <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Children. Luke, language! With a shake of my head, I usher Kylie towards the parlor and order a maid to bring food for us. Whatever breakfast there is along with a cup of coffee for me and an ice cream for Kylie. But I can't leave the kid alone for too long, unless I want to let her turn the other room into a slaughter ground. Sheesh. True to my expectations, I've only left Kylie alone for a few minutes, but she's already made herself comfortable. With a terrifying doll. But the dino's cute, so is the teddy bear. The stuff from her backpack has been left scattered across the room, from coloring books and crayons to toys. She's well equipped to amuse herself with no trouble, though I can certainly breathe a little easier she won't bring her doll along every time she visits. Narcisa, or Sisa, is a creepy little bugger. I like that she's got a Spanish flair to her, but there's something unsettling about her. It doesn't help when Kylie left her during one. Finding the thing at the bottom of the stairs staring up at me at 3 o'clock in the fucking morning is a memory that won't be leaving me anytime soon. Even now, it stares at me from where it's seated. I'm wholly tempted to just throw the thing into the fireplace and banish it from whence it came. I can buy her a prettier doll. A better toy. I will break it, find a way to get rid of it, if it wasn't from Hana, and if only Kylie isn't so attached to it. The thing is some antique doll she found for the brat's sixth birthday. 
One of a kind. My darling Hana loves her so. And Kylie does try to be a good goddaughter, but she just can't keep her interest long with the wife. It's not something that Hana does wrong on her part. She just she does try so very, very hard. It's just that she doesn't quite know how to really handle children. She'd never been around other children when she was young, surrounded by protective adults who cater to her every whim and worry for her safety every minute. When she isn't able to keep up with Kylie, her first instinct is to be strict. Impose rules on the child. Treat her as if she is made of spun glass, like every movement might break her. Says the guy who was just freaking out about her running down the stairs and breaking her neck. I, at least, have some idea from being around street kids. I know the games they've played and how they think. I know that scraps and skin knees are all part of childhood. Even with how I grew up, I had time to be a child and not some sheltered heiress. With Kylie, as behaved as she can be, with her toys and her books and arts, she has to use up all her energy somehow. To run around the playground and make a mess in the mud, or to even just fake wrestle for a short while. Let her be a child when she wants, I'll say. If it becomes too much, just bribe her with sweets or ship her back to her papa. Problem solved. Unfortunately, Hana isn't quite up for those sort of things most of the time, thinking it'll spoil the child. It turns the whole playdate awkward every time. Taking the last seat left, I pluck one of her coloring books from the table to see it filled with dinosaurs. Cool. Not exactly what I expect to see for a little girl, but... Eh, it doesn't hurt anyone. If she wants to play with dolls and cars, or dolls with their cars, what do I care? She wants to put dolls tutus on model cars, even. Oh, this is a new one. The last one you had was filled with horses, wasn't it? Those were ponies, Tio! They're much cuter than horses. Mm. We went to a dinosaur zoo, and it was awesome! Fairy, Zeno, Fairy, uh, dinosaurs are my favorite. <laughs> Fairy dinosaurs. I have no idea what that is, but it must be something. I'm only familiar with the T-Rex myself. Yeah, they found uh, fossils of its claws. They're really long. They think the whole theory might be a bazillion meters tall. Even bigger than a T-Rex! Cisa says it'll be big enough to eat all my classmates. I've never seen this look from Kylie before. Yep. Need to banish that doll from whence it came. She only laughs as I scrunch up my nose and grimace. Takako says you're making a really funny face! Takako's... here. Okay. Taka who? Takako, a friend I made. When did you make this friend? Because I assume... I assume they were friends before the mansion was bought, right? So how would she... She would have had to read the letter or... A... A version of the letter? To be able to see her? And why is she leaving Kylie alive and not terrifying her? Huh. I have to stop and look around, expecting one of the help to be there. The child does have a way of befriending just about anyone as long as she puts her mind to it. Yet the two of us are completely alone. Thankfully, she only finds my disturbed look as another funny grown-up expression. That might be a lot more problematic than whether she plays with dolls or cars, though. Both the thoughts of Sisa giving Kylie ideas, and one of said ideas being Massacre by Dinosaur. <laughs> Something I probably need to bring up with her father, aside from work. But beyond murderous dinosaurs, creepy dolls, and imaginary friends, I find no trouble with Kylie. She's as energetic and precocious as any tyke her age can be. She's an angel as she can get comfy and settled in after getting her sweets. Ooh! Man, that looks good. We tuck into our waffles as soon as food is brought in. Our waffles, because she wanted her own plate to go with the ice cream as soon as she saw mine. A fresh plate of berries is brought in as well, which really goes great with the rest of this feast, as Kylie puts it. And if I indulge in the sweetness, I have a cup of black coffee to pair it off with. With our bellies full, Kylie grows content with just scribbling on a scrap of paper and calmly chatting about her week. 
She talks of her older brother, Rowan, and their parents, how they plan to go to the Bloxland in Berkshire for the winter holidays. She mentions Miss Pink, Rebecca, which I listened to with half an ear. Our initial meeting had been a mess, but I can't quite find myself to listen to stories about her teacher wholeheartedly, the phantom sting in my hands still itching. She talks of the sad man in the park, Zack, and of her new friend who likes to play hide-and-seek when she's not sniffling in the loo. Yes, Takako. When, finally, she finds nothing new to talk about, she goes back to her drawings. That'll change as soon as her stomach settles, of course. The calm before the storm. Because, behaved as she is right now, I can feel the curiosity just radiating off her. There is a restlessness buzzing under her skin and a question on the tip of her tongue, as they often are with children her age. But for now, I can take this piece with no complaint for however long it stays. I have fun with the crayons as well, at the child's insistence even if I can't really draw. With Kylie using the black crayon, that leaves me with the blue one. I absentmindedly start to draw a puppy to the best of my abilities. It's as I attempt to give the doodle dogs another eye that Kylie breaks her silence. Tio? Where did Tia go? I saw them leave when I got here. I'm not to the hospital. Tia didn't look so good. I've been expecting a lot of different questions. The kid always has a whole bunch of them ready for me, but I can only sigh when she posed this particular one. She's just going to the doctors for a checkup. And as kids go, there are follow-up questions. And you didn't go with her? Well, somebody had to watch you. Well, you were going to be here, sweetie, so I had to stay behind. So she's all alone? At the hospital? No, Johans is with her. Oh, no, of course not. Tia has Johans and her maid and a god. She's got plenty of company. Yeah, but you're not with her. If I didn't know better, I'd say the kid is trying to make me feel guilty. I want to say that the little tyke is evil for making me feel so. But I understand. When I get sick, Papa and Mama have to leave me with their maids, too. Aw, that's very sad. Well, they don't take care of you. That doesn't sound right. Even my mom took care of me when I was sick as a child. Well, they're always busy with work. Oh. Oh, I see. I I guess that's no good. And now I'm feeling even more guilty. I know she doesn't mean to accuse me of anything. But as her father's boss, maybe I do overwork Suarez a bit. There's a lot of responsibilities that only he is capable of carrying out. Delegation is the thing, sure. But when said responsibilities are legally questionable at best, putting others to the task isn't always an option. But... Maybe your papa is in need of some vacation time. He deserves it, doesn't he? He's a hard worker. I could arrange something for the holidays. <laughs> She's like, what? I could cut him some slack. Some of his assignments can wait. I can't do much for her mum. She isn't one of my employees, but this would have to suffice. It will be worth it if it makes the little girl happy, because just like that, the somber look on her face turns into one of pure joy. It's like looking at a little sun, warm and bright. It's nice to do something kind every now and then. Would you really, Tio? Would you like that? I'd like that very much, yeah! We, we can go to this museum! She's one with lots of cool trains and planes. I like trains. And there's the local manor theme park. And a monkey forest. There's a kid adventure farm too. The wacky warehouse. And a play barn as well. And, and... Wow, you got the whole vacation planned out. <laughs> Whoa, slow down there, munchkin. Oh, that's a cute sprite. I know you're excited, but I think you should let me schedule your dad's day off before you plan a whole year's worth of stuff. <laughs> There's an embarrassed giggle, but she does reel herself in, enough to calm down. Which is a feat in and of itself. It's obvious how giddy she is. And if she wasn't looking forward to the holidays before, like any child should, she does now. I think Tia would be really happy if you were with her. You could have told me you needed to go to the hospital with her, Tia. I won't be angry. Aw, thanks. I'd love to be with her, but I wanted to spend time with you, Munchkin. <laughs> and she told me to stay. Besides, I don't like hospitals. They always smell like alcohol. They're not the good kind, either. Huh. I don't think anybody likes hospitals. They're scary. They are scary, Kylie. But you said Tia is brave and strong. That she is. Aw, the blush. 
A content silent, silence comes over us as we go back to scribbling. Though I stop when I'm done with my blue dog, cringing at how awful it looks. Kylie reprimands me for that because I should be like her. The little tyke goes through several sheets of paper, one drawing after another. Practicing, she says, because practice makes perfect. Not to mention there's a drawing contest coming up in class and she just has to beat Tim from Class D, who says girls can't be superheroes. Thanks, Tim. The clay gets a turn, too, where we start sculpting food and pretending we're Michelin chefs. When we're too tired from tossing pizza and making cakes, there's no trouble in finding another activity more relaxing for the both of us. I find myself invested in reading The Picture of Dorian Gray once more. Often I lose myself in the pages of the book. However, it is rather difficult to do so when I'm also trying to keep an eye and an ear out for Kylie. I've been reading the same paragraph over and over again, even. Inexplicably, I can feel my skin crawl when the girl sits with Narcissa by the parlor's fireplace, humming, singing. If it's London Bridge, I swear. Though I ignore it long enough to hear only the tail end of the song. Everything is up in flames, up in flames, up in flames. Everything is up in flames, my fair lady. I don't remember that as being part of the original nursery rhyme. Okay, that's fine. We're just gonna move on from that. Right. So this is right after... This is in between Ash comforting Isabella and leaving to go to the mansion. With Hana away for a checkup, Luke was left alone to watch over his godchild, Kylie Suarez. However, what was supposed to be a simple babysitting turned awkward when the precocious child began spouting bizarre things. Slightly concerning. I don't think I can spend any more time with Kylie, considering how high-strung I feel. So, it's a, it is a good thing that Suarez came for her as soon as I've called. Though it is earlier than the agreed-upon time, he voices no complaint. The bastard even has a look of relief as soon as they left. Or at least I interpreted it as such from where I've stood by one of the windows, not bothering to step out and greet the man. No doubt he still doesn't trust me around his spawn. Well, he has every right to be suspicious of me. I am a dangerous man, after all. But to my chagrin, that leaves me with the rest of the day with nothing to do. Why are you so high-strung, Luke? I know you're worried about Hana, but come on. Oh, I guess there was also the ghost lady in the gardens. Well, aside from picking up the mess Kylie left scattered about in the parlor... To my immense, immense relief, she remembered to take her doll home with her this time. But the same cannot be said of the crayons and papers littered here and there. First things first. I snatch my own doodle off the table and rip it to shredge, shredge, leaving no hope that it will see the light of day. The rest of the drawings, all Kylie's, remain unharmed as I collect the lot. Though they have been stacked neatly on the table before, they must have been blown about when I saw Kylie off. Maybe Takako wanted to draw a picture. And there are plenty of them. From cats and cakes to colorful rainbows and gardens, the child managed to make a lot during her morning here. There is one more that I have to fish out of the fireplace where it landed. When everything is up in flames. Expecting to see another one of Kylie's masterpiece, I am instead greeted with something a bit more concerning. A good drawing. So you do see her as the bloody woman with the the voice the like her mouth is in a scream. You see that, and you're not afraid, Kylie. There is me, and there is Kylie. The two of us side by side and smiling as our stick figure selves stand in a nondescript field. Now, is this a scream, or is she frowning and that's her hair coming in front of the frown? It's one of the two. That much I can ascertain without looking at the labels below the doodle doodle's feet. Well, I guess that's confirmation. Her name is Takako. But a third figure stands next to me in the drawing. A woman with her face hidden behind a curtain of black. 
Takako, the writing under her supplies. I will ignore the blood on her dress. Takako says you're making a really funny face. One big happy family. Taka who? Takako, a friend I made. Oh, there's the whispers. The hair is on the back of my neck stand on end, and I feel a chill go down my spine. A breath. That isn't mine. That has me turning around, expecting, hoping, to see someone, anyone. But nothing. And that's when I hear it. Oh boy. Laughter. Sweet and merry laughter ringing from the ballroom. Thinking about it has my cheeks burning and my blood running hot. It's as if I'm being mocked. As I stomp towards the door. That's some good stomping. I have to stop myself from shouting up a storm. I expect to see some of the help dallying about, idle from their duties. Perhaps they thought they could slack off in their duties without the head butler around and with my preoccupation with Kylie. Well, they had another thing coming. But again, nothing. Nothing from what I can see with a cursory glance at the very least. I roam around looking for near impossible hiding places, and still I am all alone. Yet I can still hear the laughter. That accursed laughter echoing about in the room. In my head. Who's there? Show yourselves and show some respect to the master of the house. Master of the house. Cold uneasiness settles into my stomach when no one answers. I stumble on my own two feet, feeling a wave of nausea come from nowhere. That's similar to what Becca goes through. I have to put a hand against the wall to stay upright when the world shifts and pain explodes from behind my eyes. It takes every ounce of my self-control not to heave then and there. The only thing my pride allowed me to do then is to close my eyes and attempt to alleviate some of the pain. Vague, unfamiliar images, dare I say memories, not mine, flash in my head, unbidden and unwelcome. Like a strong hammer strike to the head, threatening to crack my skull and split it in two. Whatever emotions they hold are muted. I'm nothing but a spectator. Still, its weight feels palpable. Though it doesn't take long for these sensations to get into my head. Through my eyes and my ears, it creeps and buzzes in the spaces between. One after the other, they come at me. An unending flood that threatens to sweep me away for what feels like an eternity. Each one a show of both joy and suffering for those who have called this mansion their home. Oh, interesting. I wonder... I've got a theory. There, for those who are not aware, there is a portion of this game in the gallery section. There's a section that's entitled Memory Fragments. And I've not gotten any in my first playthrough here. But I'm wondering if during this scene, assuming this scene happens, no matter what version of the, like what, what choices you've made up to this point, assuming the scene always happens, I wonder if this is when you would see flashes of these memory fragments replaying and that those fragments are important to actually getting the true ending. Just the fact that it's black and he's the way he's wording it, I feel like there should be some imagery here, but we're not seeing it because we haven't unlocked those fragments yet. That's my theory. Each one a show of both joy and suffering for those who have called this mansion their home. Each new scene is like a hammer to the head, threatening to crack my skull and split it in two. I can feel every little emotion in the blurry images that present itself in my head. I feel a part of these. Like I've lived through them, though I know that it's not possible. All their anger burns through me. That much is evident. But the pain? The pain more so. And above all of it are the whispers. The voices calling, luring, until one image emerges in vivid contrast with the others. When there's a shout of joy, my eyes snap open looking for the culprit. That's when the whole room just... changes. Everything is the same, yet everything isn't. In living memory. It's them, and Takako is there watching. And what- are you still holding the drawing? Or a new version of the letter? 
There are people everywhere laughing and dancing. I should be concerned about them, but my mind finds it easy to dismiss them as they fade in and out from nothingness. Instead, I find my concentration drawn to a man and a woman, though one can only call them a lord and a lady going by their clothes. And oh, just see how happy the couple looks. Though the man's eyes are eerily blank, like he's not all there. His face is familiar, though. In fact, they both are. But I can't quite place why. Well, you have portraits of them all around your house. Well spotted, though, Luke. His eyes are eerily blank. The two make for a pretty picture as they dance in the center of the ballroom. Even the phantom crowd's attention stay on them. It reminds me so much of Hana and I during the early days of our marriage. The honeymoon years, they call it. We were happy then, too. All smiles and her sunshine, even with the normal dreary weather. Younger, we had less to worry about. Or at least thought that way. I thought, wished, we could go on that way, even with all that I did and had to do. But life has a way of catching up. There was work to be done. Although we had to stay the loving, perfect couple in public, I could not afford to look so weak. To appear tied down to someone else to those who knew who I really am. I had to harden my heart when I had business, but it hadn't always been so easy to just switch that part of me on and off. I should be concerned about their intrusion, too. Ask what in bloody hell they are doing in my house, throwing a party as if they own the place. Ask myself how the fuck I didn't notice what was going on before, when the parlor and the foyer are both only a few doors away. But I have the feeling that yelling and screaming at them won't do much of anything anyway. None of the others have given me notice. I realize that this might not even be real. It dawns on me that these two are the people from the paintings, the ones all over the mansion. Which makes sense. I don't think I'm imaginative enough to make all this up on my own. This must be a dream. Or a really horrible high. Just then I can feel eyes on me as I contemplate the absurdity of the situation. Yet I find difficulty in trying to tear my eyes away from the two dancing. You probably don't want to look at Takako. I manage. And I regret looking away. Yeah, there she is. Not quite as beautiful as she was before. The woman from the garden stands beside me. I can hear her rattling breath, menacing and chilling. Everything in me screams to run. But something pins me to the spot as she just looks at me, watching and waiting. The clamor of their voices fill the ballroom. Although they say such welcoming words, I do not feel comforted by the madness I'm expect experiencing. Their joyous voices turn sinister and foreboding to my ears. The chorus of people, people that shouldn't exist, threaten to overwhelm me, drown me even as I stand on dry land. The music still plays as the phantom quartet continues while I stand here, vulnerable and afraid, but the dance has already ended. And I'm afraid that I might just be tonight's entertainment. Attention is all well and good until bollocks like this go down. These phantom people watch me, thousands of eyes scrutinizing, though they cheer for my return, cajole me to dance and join the merriment. They're all waiting for the lord of the house. There are eager hands all over, pulling me in every direction, but they do not move me enough to remove me from the woman's gaze. Listen, can you not hear them as they welcome you home? Your kind? Our kind? Our kind? What kind is that? You're one of us, my love. We are bonded by the blood we share. Are we related? Somehow? Or does she mean they're both killers? And that's the blood they share? If I thought the voices were overwhelming before, it is nothing compared to how they are now. Their voices are loud, speaking in unison and echoing ever on in the spaces of my head. They welcome me back, as if I've always belonged, as if I was meant to be here in the first place. They call me all these titles and names that do not belong to me and that man's face. The one with the empty eyes flashes again before me, once fleetingly, like a new memory having burned itself in my mind. I have to struggle for air when I come back to myself after. I'm not. This isn't. The welcomes turn into screams at my protest, pained and desperate pleas for my help, telling me that it is my duty to stay. 
telling me that I belong among them, to them. Gentle touches turn near threatening. The warning scratches and the baring of teeth by predators before they truly maim someone. My mouth goes dry as I struggle to speak some sense in this hallucinatory madness. But I don't get the chance as they drown out my voice. Our lord. My. Prince. Your prince, huh? At her words, there is a compulsion to stay. Though my heart races in my chest, the fear I should be experiencing refuses to register in my head. Mind and body war with each other, nearly tearing me in two. Oh, you finally returned to us. The compulsion to walk into her arms is strong. Whispers in my head tell me to go to her. They say that she is safety. She is home and heart. We have been waiting for so long. But repulsed at these thoughts, I wrench away and turn with a small gasp. Without hesitation, I start to make a run for it. I nearly falter when an angry shriek pierces the air, inhumane and monstrous. I don't dare look back. I just run. I didn't care if this is a drug-induced hallucination or not. Just run! Out of the ballroom. It's nighttime now. It's been a while. Oh man, this all happened before he said goodbye to Becca. Alone, Luke heard voices coming from the nearby ballroom. When he decided to investigate, he was assaulted by memories not of his own. And at the center of it all is the same woman who appeared before him the day before. And out of the parlor. It's only then that I bother to look back, hoping and praying to the god I scorn that it did not pursue me. I would have run all the way out of the mansion, too, if only someone didn't get in my way. Johans? I collide with a body much larger than mine and fall back to the ground, head spinning as I look up at the stained glass. Turning my head to the side replaces the colorful sight with a pair of shiny black shoes. Fatigue fills every inch of my being then, making me refuse to get up. Meanwhile, a familiar head of ginger hair looks down at me in bemusement. You really must look where you're going if you insist on running about. Do tell, where is the fire? You don't want to know, man. Oh, thank God you're here! I do hope you don't have a concussion. Can you count backwards from 15 to 1 for me? Oh, fuck off, you <laughs> wanker! Just help me up! I do not think insulting me if you do have a concussion is a smart decision. But no, really. 15 to 1. That woman, she was here. I told you to keep an eye out for her. The other man offers an arm and pulls me up to my feet then. But before I can storm off and pull him to the ballroom, he anchors me down with one hand on my shoulder and the other touching the back of my head. No bruising or bump. That still does not mean that you don't have a concussion. If you are too lazy to count backwards, can you tell me your full name? Where are you currently? Everyone is obsessed with concussions in this game. We don't have <laughs> Lucille Mitchell Wright. And this right. is the God bloody fucking foyer. But we don't have time for this. You must make and have the time to make sure you are not broken in the head. I have already sent security to scour the whole house when I saw you running out of the parlor, Doomkopf. Thanks. If the woman is here, they will have her. You will only be slowing them down if you plan to interfere. When he points that out, I realize that there are guards starting to filter into the house as we speak with some already searching the nearby rooms. Armed and uniformed men go about in pairs, making it so that the house is a, in a flurry of activity. He lets go of me, then, with the knowledge that I'm not going to keel over any time soon. I was hoping that you would be tired from dealing with the young miss on my return. Instead, you come running and hit your head. Such a troublesome boy. Shall I be carrying you to bed, too? Sure. I can manage just fine on my own. Though I don't see how I can sleep until that woman is caught. It'll be easier to keep you safe in your quarters. This is twice we've known the woman to break in. I think we can safely presume that you hold her interest. That's for sure. He says it as a matter of fact, in a tone that brooks no ar- Brook? Brooks? No argument? Not like I'll argue it if it means I'm kept safe. The two of us hurry upstairs, though we remain watchful and wary of any potential threats to my person. We make it to the master bedroom without any trouble, though, and two of the security are left outside the door. No problems at all. Not until we get inside. Johan's eyes scan the room wildly, a look of dread on his usually stoic face. 
and I don't understand for a moment. Looking around the bedroom, it's empty. But then I realize Hana's not there. That's why you guys were freaking out. Where's Hana? She came home with you from the hospital, didn't she? She's supposed to be here. I sent one of the maids to accompany her here, to let her rest. I've never seen this look on Johans before. I feel the color drain from my face when he raises a hand to stop me from charging out there. Stay. I'm not staying in here while Hana stays out there. One of the guards will find her and bring her here. And what if they don't? What if that woman gets to her first? What if she already has her? That's not possible. You can't promise that. <laughs> I've got my knife. There's no second thought as I reach under my side of the bed and pull out one of my knives. I have no doubt that the other man can take me on if we are both unarmed. But with this, I can even the field. Or at least deter him from escalating the situation and risking hurting either of us. I'm going out there to look for Hana. And you're either with me or you aren't. I'm not risking Hana, and I'm not leaving her alone! Still, like a stubborn mule, he refuses to budge from the door. There's a withering look on him that I try to match. One that somehow I am losing fast to, even with him not saying a word yet. Can you see yourself in the mirror right now? You are in no proper state to go looking for anyone. If it will make you happy, I will do the looking. But please, and don't make me repeat this, stay where it's safe where security can find you. No wonder Luke was in such a mood when we ran into him with Ash and the others. He had had a hell of a day, had this crazy trip with this woman, lost his wife, and was just going insane with worry. We already have one person to be worried about. Please don't add another one to it. Perhaps it is his tone. In spite of his general disdain for virtually everything that has to do with me, I'd like to think that over the years he has grown to care for Hana, at least. Much as I loathe to admit this, I trust him with her safety over any servant in this house. So an acquiesce. You have two hours, Shuroken. I don't think it'll take that long to find one missing woman in this house. Two hours! Any more than that, and I'm going out there. Of course. Despite his words, he lingers. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he wants to make sure I get in that damn bed and sleep before he turns away from me. What am I? A child? Watching me and treating me like one? There's the reason why we will never get along. Well, what are you waiting for? And the knife? <laughs> what are you planning to do with that? The knife stays. <laughs> Just in case. Very well. Only then does he seem to get the hint. Bumping into Luke after his flight from the ballroom, Johans quickly ushered the paranoid man to his room, while the house's security looked for the trespasser, only to be greeted by a room devoid of Hana, who was supposed to have arrived with the butler. With a nod, he leaves, locks, and closes the door behind him. For a moment, I still hear his voice while he gives the guards outside firm instructions, then a hush as soon as, as soon as, I guess, as he departs and his footsteps fade away. One that doesn't quite last. As quickly as the silence settles, lightning flashes across the sky, followed immediately by the loud boom of thunder. And that wanker strikes so dangerously close that I can feel the electricity in the air. The power goes out, not a second later, and I feel as if I'm being mocked by whatever greater power there is. All is deathly still for a moment, but soon the rain starts once again. Far heavier than the light drizzle from this morning, its pitter-patter hitting hard against this place's roof. Despite the noise, I find myself drawn to my bed, exhausted, hoping for a little nap. I'm safe here. Hana will be safe too. Shroken will find her, and when I wake, she'll be here. It does not take long. Once my head hits the pillow, in a matter of minutes, darkness claims me. This is all in inverted. <laughs> Bringing with it laughters and whispers of a twisted love from a time long gone. Who are you? St stay away! Well, that's a bad sign. Sweet dreams, my love. It'll be over soon. Apparently there's <laughs> a robot ghost. <laughs> that's fine. It's just a robot ghost. Now what? 
Yet in spite of the unfamiliar voices and unwanted touches from shadows lurking in the dark, rousing is a slow, arduous process. Difficult, every limb heavy with lead. No matter my aversion for the words they murmur in my ears or the sight of her horrid smile from afar, my body refuses to yield. I am at their mercy. Beyond fathomable, fathomable, beyond fathomable reason, my consciousness refuses the pull of the waking world, choosing to linger in the pits of a dream, gradually drawing me deeper into unknown depths. Somehow, even if it might mean I may never open my eyes, I allow them. Mm-hmm. Not that I mind getting a few extra hours, of course. The bed's more than comfortable as it is. After an exhausting day yesterday. Babysitting Kylie and the stress of finding an intruder in my own home. I think I deserve a little break every once in a while. Especially after going through all that in a single day. I can only be on the receiving end of so many unacceptable things within the span of a few hours, you know? As gracious a host and person I am, my patience has its limits, too. Although there's still that problem with Hana. I haven't forgotten that, of course, but that's why I hired Shroken. He's competent enough. He won't even last a day in my service if he's any lesser than those half-wits who think they can deceive me with sweet words. He's more than capable of working on his own without guidance. Let the butler take care of that little problem with Hana while I... Hana. You do not need. We? This is where your home is. As you know, for the blood we share. That again, huh? Come back to us. How long has it been since? Johans has never taken this long before. He's currently handcuffed and he kinda got shocked. Surely there should have been an update by now. <clears throat> Alright. So why isn't there? No. No. Please. Please don't go. Bloody hell, the Cretans I've surrounded myself with. And isn't that enough reason to force myself out of bed? As it has always been the case? No. No. Uh-oh. Just gonna cut that off. My eyes fly open, expecting the warm rays of sunshine filtering through the curtains. Only to be greeted by a blinding flash of light and a loud boom of thunder that sounded nearly too close to my ears. Strong gusts of wind will occasionally burst in from the open balcony door, bringing in drizzles of cold rain into the room. I must have left it open earlier before dozing off. The carpet in the floor closest to it is already drenched. Hannah's going to be so cross when she sees this. Not that it's an immediate problem. If anything, it's this power outage we should be minding first. With the intruder still at large, staring through this darkness might be far more fatal than multiple stab wounds or a gunshot to the chest. Oh, great. The power's still out. That is exactly what I need right now. Yes. Yes. It's the storm, of course. I should have moved back to the penthouse to weather it in a much more comfortable setting. Already I can hear the creak and groans of this old place as rain beats against the windows. Yo, Hans! Has someone been sent to take the circuit breaker yet? No answer. Yo, Hans! Silence. Shroken! Someone! Anyone? They're all dead. Still nothing, and my cordial mood is quickly dissipating. <sighs> Where are those idiots when you need them? It's really a wonder why he hasn't fixed this yet. Was I really out that long? Can't be. It has only been a few hours after midnight, at the time of my wristwatch is anything to go by. Unless I've forgotten to change it again after that last overseas trip a month ago. Though the delay is understandable if he went looking for Hana as he promised. But bloody hell, my safety's also at stake here! Cursing, I stay still, letting my eyes try and adjust to the darkness while my hands fumble for my slippers. If that butler isn't going to fix this, I may as well order the security posted outside to do it. It's probably just a blown fuse. Anyone with a brain can repair one. Grabbing my jacket and with footwear finally on, I make for the door. Although in haste, I pause briefly when a gleam catches my eye. On one of my drawers, underneath the clutter I've yet to organize, the muzzle of a gun peeks out. 
Hana has never openly commented my possession of it, but I know she does not approve of it, knowing the bloody firearms policy in this nation. Of course, I've not found much use for it in the seven years we've been together, otherwise she would have already had it thrown out years ago. Doesn't mean it won't be useful right now. Without second thought, I seize it, sending the stuff piled above it onto the floor. It... Whatever. I'll get to it later. What did you knock down? This blackout problem should be resolved first. Right next to my missing security detail, as it turns out. Where the fuck did everyone go? Where is everyone? There were two, weren't there? Shroken had two blokes posted to stand guard for the night. I might be panicking for a bit earlier, but I'm quite sure I haven't gotten delusional yet. What, did both of them decide to take a break? Because they think the master is already sound asleep and won't be looking for them. Damn nitwits. I know assassinations happen very rarely these days, and even less in a peaceful city like Luxburn, but bollocks! There's been a woman going in and out of this place uninvited, who may or may not want to put a knife in my back. Isn't that enough reason to stay on alert? I'm fairly certain Shroken won't just enlist their help just for this power outage, only to leave me unprotected. We have a... difficult friendship, so to speak, but I doubt that man is an opportunist. I'm holding the lives of his family in my hands, after all. Pardon? You mean, like, if anything happens, you're just gonna kill his husband or whatever? He knows what I am capable of doing. He's not stupid enough to do anything that will endanger them and save only himself. So where, then? Only my footsteps echo a long, dark passage, and I am left gripping the handle of my pistol for some sort of comfort. Without proper lighting and with the storm still raging outside, the stories I've heard about this place seem to have some truth to it. Some. If I'm reaching and wish to entertain myself for a bit, I'll say there might also be ghosts whispering in my ears, calling. Of course, it's just the wind and the trees rustling outside. Nothing good will come of allowing these thoughts to linger when problems are piling up in front of me one after another. Especially with what greets me once I get to the foyer. Let's read about it. Where is it? Oh, it's November. Oh. Um... And after that, after that... Ah, before that. Okay, gotcha. I kind of feel like these two pictures should be switched around, but whatever. Luke Wright woke up to a storm raging outside, and with his whole house eerily quiet. Power was still off, and his butler was nowhere to be found, even when called. Taking his gun with him, he went out to investigate, and in the foyer of his own home... Draw. Though it's dark, the large windows illuminate the area much more easily than any of the other rooms. Hello, everyone. And from where I stand at the top of the stairs, I can easily make out their forms. Recognize them, even. It's all gone crazy when these intruders come into my house. I'm no stranger to a cop playing dirty. The smart ones know that neither life nor criminals are going to play fair. I really don't want to say that word. Okay, well, learn something new about Luke. Ugh, I guess I better read it. Uh, I don't like it. And if one of this wog sword is in on this, I'm not surprised to. But Lily, the estate agent, she doesn't seem the sort. And Daisy, too. What will Kylie think of her, Miss Pink, if the poor tyke finds out about this? Not to mention Mint. Hana trusted her. I trusted her to be a professional at the very least, for fuck's sake. To top it all off, they all have the nerve, the nerve, to look surprised when I announce my presence. Well, well, what have we here? <laughs> if I were any less sober, I'd say this is the beginning of a joke. When did you have time to drink? Bloody trespassers. What is wrong with these people? Do they really think I'll be fine with them walking into my home like this? What are they even doing in here? If I didn't know any better, they might also be behind Hana's disappearance. That's right, my love. Go away. They must have a motive. Make them pay. And it better be a good one. For a wrong face, not to us. 
Why are you a robot all of a sudden in the last ten minutes? Or a bullet to the head is the least all of them will deserve. Let's see. A photographer, a high school teacher, a real estate agent, an interior designer walk into a mansion. And the punchline is... Thunder crackles once again, cutting me off. This time its sound hits close enough that it nearly feels as if the windows and the ground itself are rumbling. All is deathly still for a moment. I don't let it stop me, however, as I slowly make my way towards them, taking one careful step at a time, relishing the expression of fear in their eyes. I suppose there's something ominous in this setting, with the heavy rain outside and the lack of light here. I kind of like it, to be honest. Add something to the atmosphere. I suppose I must look like the villain now. Now I'm the bad guy. But short of me getting close to them, a noise to my left distracts me, briefly halting my movements while curiosity takes over every murmurs in my head. And it's a good thing, perhaps, that I did. Because as soon as I look up, I see him. Another trespasser. Great. Just as he's about to jump down from furniture that has somehow ended up piled and blocking the door to the parlor. What happened there? And did he really think it's all right to do that in other people's house? Lout. Teach him, my lord. You're the one who made the mess with the furniture. Put him in his place. My hand's already moving before any rationale can stop me. Fingers firm at my gun when I finally release the safety from it and take aim. Not at him, but at his friends. They are his, aren't they? Why else would they be here together? Doesn't matter. He won't let the people he cares about be harmed. My finger on the trigger is more than itching to shoot, but I hold back. Sure, I could have simply taken aim at him. But more than seeing him bleed, I want to see the expression on his face once he realizes everything he's doing is futile. He's trapped. Lives are in my hand. His life's in my hand. Had I known there would be a party in my own home tonight, I would have opened a bloody bottle or two. People these days, in my own home. Can you believe it? I feel so left out. I can tell the exact moment the realization dawns on him. A short second of his body freezing and blood draining from his face as soon as his feet hits the floor and he looks up. There we go again. He's already a prey trapped by his own recklessness. Oh, pathetic. And really, Daisy, even you, what would Kylie say? Luke, this isn't what you're thinking. You have to listen to us. There's something going on here. Well, obviously, why else would people be trespassing in my home? What about little Lily over there, then? What's your excuse? Checking back if your clients are doing okay? Is that it? Is this what this is? Oh, we're doing good, by the way. Sir, please. Oh, please what? Becca's right, sir. We need to get out of this place. You need to leave. Ta 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 a good enough excuse, darling. You people are the ones who need to get out of my sight. Don't worry, I might consider pressing lighter charges for the woman. Can't say the same for the rest of you. But really now, I swear the people of this city need to be taught the meaning of privacy. This is how you want to start the week. Why don't we just go with a bloody massacre if we want to surprise people in their homes, huh? It's just a passing remark, of course. I'm not stupid enough to do something that'll bring negative attention to myself. Reputation and all that, I can't just risk it. The thought of having dead bodies here? Ones that I'm not even responsible for? They're the ones who trespassed! It's... It's already quite too much. It'll literally be overkill, especially for someone like me. Nevertheless, joke or not, Feathers wastes no time drawing his own gun at the slight wave of my own. Even if he knows it's already too late. Still, he glares at me. Still, he fights back. Now, now, Feathers. Manners. You're in no position to be pointing that gun at people. There's no desperation in him, like I'm hoping. Just an annoyance flickering shortly before being hidden underneath a challenge. The likes of him are the kind of people I hate the most. Even with their failures already glaring down at them, mocking every worthless move they make, they have the impudence to stare people in the eye. Why don't you put yours down first, and then we'll talk about manners. Oh, he talks back the gall. You know, your kind pisses me off so much. Annoying most of the time. Like a damn pest you can't be rid of. But to some degree, it is... Commendable. 
I'll give him that. After all, we're almost the same in that regard. Almost. I'm still the better person, of course. He tells me to put the gun down, but I see no reason why I should. I'm a homeowner in defense of my own home. I have the right to, I'd like to think. Questionable permit of firearms aside. It's not like I wanted this. But I'm already high-strung, and their presence does not help. Bloody peasants. I can never seem to figure out how their minds fully work. Take this one, for example. Despite the pride brimming in him, how he matches my glare with one of his own, he simply lowers his pistol after a long second. Not in surrender. Oh, that's because we chose to beg. The tense set in his shoulders tells me as much. But the closest he can get to lowering his own ego in favor of something I can't quite place. Interesting. Got to admit, I'm almost disappointed. As you should be, my lord. I've expected him to hold until one of us shoots the other. Can't say it'll be more exciting that way. A bullet inside any part of my body isn't something I'd like to have on a bad day like today. Or any day, for that matter. But it'll surely be predictable of him. And I like predictable. They're the kinds of people who are the easiest to deal with, no matter the situation. With them, there's no second guessing what they'll do. He shoots, I shoot. One of us dies, the other walks away. Nothing complicated. Nothing requiring much brain power. Just muscle memory and who's the better shooter. End of story. Yet here he is, dragging a deep breath in and setting aside the only thing protecting him. I can easily shoot him this way, be done with this whole farce of a conversation. Instead, I find myself listening. A concession. For a person who, in another life, would have also become the person I am today had his circumstances allowed it. Damn shame. That he didn't end up like you? We might have gotten along. I don't understand how you two had that thought in this moment of like, you know, we probably would have been the best of friends, brothers even. Listen, right. I need you to... But alas... You broke into my house, and somehow, somehow, you expect me to listen like a good little boy. Are you a bit touched in the head, Feathers? I'm not the one breaking laws here. Look here, fucker. If I wanted you dead, I could have done it so many times already. In fact, I can easily shoot you down right here, right now. And you won't be able to do a damn thing, even with that gun. A meeting of two prideful blokes will never go well, whichever lifetime it is. <laughs> and I can only laugh at his audacity, his lack of shame and fear, even facing the business end of my pistol. You know what I'm thinking right now? In another lifetime, we would have probably gotten along well. The best truth I can offer him. Not many people, those who have slighted me in particular, live this long to see it. Yes, especially when he has a lot to answer. Preferably right now, because as generous as I have been so far, my patience has its limits. My amusement can only last for so long. In two steps, I'm standing in front of him, grabbing him by the collar and resting the cold muzzle of the eagle against his temple. Ashton! Luke, no! Here we go again. Hey, now you two, I, I'm sure we can all talk about this first. He'll end up a pretty smear on the wall this close. What is it that you people really want with me? This is the second time this week, and I'm really getting weary of this little game. Did the NCA send you to apprehend me? Or has somebody paid you off to kill me? Which one is it, Feathers? Mind you, my arm's getting tired. Better answer quick if you don't want to beat the business end of this gun. And he knows it. Of course he does. Hitman or not, he has been trained judging purely from his stance. So you don't even know he's with the cops. But not many bother to be as cautious as him. One glimpse at my handgun safety earlier is all it took for him to see I mean business. Similar. Too similar. We're too alike in so many little ways, it's funny. Down to the fact that he doesn't even flinch, no matter how heavy the threats in my words are. Even knowing how one flick of my finger on the trigger will be enough to end his sorry life. He should have caved in by now, started begging like so many others before him. Instead, he throws more vitriol, adds more kindling to a fire already burning. I'm not with NCA. I'm just here to help. There's something else in this house, and we're all in danger. You have to believe me, right? You need to let us go. 
You need to get out of here before it's too late. If you want to keep your sorry ass alive, you'll listen to people with more brain cells than you. Igniting it further that I can't help but return it to him with equal fervor. We don't need him, my love. Why, you insolent! We both decide to move in that moment, both our bodies tensing, each of us racing to get ahead of the other. However, before we can even get a head start, a voice unexpectedly rings above the chaos about to ensue. Lurk. Oh. Help me. I cut off her laugh. Sorry. Please. <laughs> there it is. I've always been cautious and careful, cutting off Trouble's head before things can escalate if I'm able. That's why I deal with the likes of Harvey, Suarez, and Johans. For all who we are, for all the enemies the likes of us can make, such a thing has never happened before. Because I do everything to make sure it doesn't happen. So to see Hana in danger? I don't quite know how to feel or what to do. Of all the times for there to be a hostage situation, if this is even one, why now? Good fucking god, what is going on here? Help me. Please. Please make it stop. I think death would be preferable if my sense of self-preservation was shot to high hell. It would deprive me of choice and of responsibility in the matter. And I don't want to think about how fast my heart beats so that I hardly hear anything other than my own heartbeat and her pleading. Please, they're in my head. Screaming. It hurts so much. I don't know if there's anything I can do about that. What do I do? What can one do against someone holding your life in their hands? With a woman that looks more monster than man. When the woman's expression turns into one of amusement and her laughter fills the air, I want to call her out on it. There's a rage simmering just beneath my skin. But my own scream dies down in my throat. All I'm able to muster is a pathetic croak. She laughs as if this is all some sick joke. My breathing becomes a bit too shallow for my liking, and I feel like I'm on a precipice where one wrong move can lead to someone dying. This is crazy. All of it. Luke, help me, please. I can't! And something in me snaps. There's a switch in my head that wants to go one way or the other. I have to... You can't keep quiet. I don't know. Mm. This could go either way. If you demand Hana's release, you're showing the ghost that you've picked Hana. That, in turn, could make her angry enough to snap her neck and throw her down the stairs at your feet. I really hope this is the right thing to do. Please don't die, Hana. That was a relationship one. Interesting. Of course I'm gonna ask for your <laughs> release. What am I doing? Why am I even hesitating? I won't go so far to claim that I'm any sort of decent human being, but this is Hana, my wife I'm talking about here. What sort of husband, what sort of father would I be if I just stood by idly while she was in danger? That doesn't change the fact that this is all fucking insane, of course. Having all these intruders is crazy. To think about going at this thing is crazy. I can hardly classify it as a person in my eyes. Perhaps a maggot that needs to be crushed under my shoe, just like the rest of this sorry lot. But a person? Hardly. But I care none for any of it. They don't matter. All that matters is that Hana and my children are in danger. But cold pours over me, freezes me in place once more when I try to make demands. I have to take deep breaths, grit my teeth, and steal my fist to even find the courage to speak up. Let go of her! Don't hurt her! Whatever it is you want! Just don't you dare hurt her! And if my voice isn't as firm as I'd like, it doesn't matter. I will beg and plead if I have to. On my knees, bend my fucking proud neck and maybe even break it, just to make sure she's safe. It's not her life alone that is in danger. Our children's lives are on the line. Even mine, perhaps. Because I don't know what I would do if anything happened to Hana. I will plead for the woman who will be the mother of my children. The cold stillness is gone from my body and my very skin feels like it's on fire. And I have to shout, scream at her when Hana continues to cry out in pain. What do you want? Money? Is that it? I give you however much you want. 
Luke, please make it stop. I want it to stop. Just stop whatever it is you're doing to her. Can't you see she's hurting? I cannot stand for this. Let go of her. Now. Maybe not at the top of the stairs. I say it with such ridiculous conviction. And of course she won't listen. Why would she? She has the upper hand here. There is no reason for her to do as I ask. But... Her voice is but a whisper and deathly slow, and I'm hard-pressed to hear it over the pounding of my heart in my ears. She speaks, the woman from the gardens and the servant girl from the ballroom. From the hallucination, vision, memories, whatever they were. A hush settles over the room as we listen. Do you really wish to be with her? There are no second thoughts. More than anything. So please, let her go. A life for a life. That's worrying. Though her expression doesn't change, I have this awful feel most awful feeling that it wasn't the answer she was looking for. I can see how the woman fingers tighten around Hana's throat, hear the hitch in her breath. And I fear that I've made the worst decision in speaking out. Oh god. I didn't think she will listen. Yet she does. She really did? Huh. Yeah. Angered, Luke demanded for Hana's release from the woman. Although the woman eventually released his wife, there was anger and contempt in her face. All of a sudden, the whole house shifted, and a blink, blood, and gore was everywhere. Spoilers. A hand on Hana's back sends her falling down the stairs. I move to catch her, and that sends us both sprawling at the foot of the stairs. With my back to the ground and her on top of me, the pain doesn't even register in my head. All I can worry about is Hana and the baby's well-being as I pull the both of us off the ground and away from the stairs. Away from her. Are you alright, Hana? Are you hurt? Aw. It takes much too long for my liking before she speaks. All she's able to do for a moment is whimper in pain, a hand to her throat. And when she does manage to speak, her voice is far too faint, along with the hold she has on my arm. It's terrifying to see her like this, and to think I nearly lost her. I'm... We are fine, Luke. I'm sorry. Just... just give me a moment. For a moment, we forget. But... You deserve each other. What does that mean? Just hearing her voice triggers something in Hana, and she starts to tear up. Her face contorts into one of pain and fear. But I grab her by the shoulders to keep her in place so that she can see me and only me. And so that I can only see her too. Look at me, Hana. Look, I'm here. You're safe. I won't let her hurt you again. Do you understand? Just breathe. I don't know exactly what in bloody hell is going on. Yet I can't find it in me to care. Whoever these people are and whatever they're here for. These are not acceptable conditions for a pregnant woman. And I will not stand for it. For all I know, this is all some dumb charade to get to me. All the times I have seen the woman before, it could have all been an act to get to me. To get under my skin. And to think they dare hurt Hana. For all that the fear that I had felt, seeing her touch Hana, I can only think of her as an actress in grotesque makeup. My hand still shakes, the fear not having quite gone. But anger fills me as I look at the woman, a sneer on my face. How? How dare you! I don't care who you are, but how dare you touch Hana! I want you out of my house! Out before I call the police and have you put away for the rest of your miserable life! And that goes for all of you! I think they'd be more than happy to leave by now, Luke. I hold my ground, firm and strong, with my declaration. <laughs> But the nerve of her! She just laughs in my face. A terrible, dreadful laugh that makes me feel as if there are ants crawling on my skin and maggots squirming into my ears. You are telling me to get out of your house. <laughs> Not my house, I guess. You threatened to lock me up. <laughs> she laughs, and she laughs. What's so funny? What are you laughing at? None of this is funny! But she persists, and it almost feels like her voice is in my head. Oh, oh no. no different. No different. You're all the same. You can all suffer together. And that is when everything turns to complete and utter shite. Oh, here we go. 
It's a slow thing. A whisper more than a bang as the darkness creeps into every corner of the room. The walls shudder and groan. Blood runs from the ceiling, crawls down the walls, and stains the floor. It feels as if life itself is being sucked from the house slowly but surely. The beauty of the place is gone, with only the dead, decaying remains of a mansion left in its wake. I don't have to wonder if it is just the foyer that's become this nightmarish place. I can already hear it. Gone are the growling of thunder and the lashings of rain and wind against the foyer's high windows. All of it has been replaced by a more grating sound. A cacophony of voices from nowhere and everywhere echoing throughout the now horrid walls. A voice that neither belongs to us nor the people who live here. What? What's going on? Help! Please! All throughout the house, shouts of alarm and surprise ring out. A mirror to the horror creeping up in each of us. Who wouldn't be shocked? This is... Insane. Even Daisy, feisty woman that she is, trembles at the sight of it, clinging desperately to Lily while Steel and Feather stand protectively in front of the other two. In front of the two. Brave of them, I have to admit, to put themselves in the front line like that. Though it doesn't necessarily mean they don't feel the same fear as the rest of us. Something I don't blame them for. There seems to be no end in sight to this insanity. If anything, this only feels like it's the beginning. Of the end. Help me! Oh my god! Please! Somebody! Anybody! Uh, who are you? Stay! Stay away! No, no, no! Stay away! Was that Johans? Oh no, did she get Yo- We- Oh! We left Johans handcuffed. Did she get him? Oh no! I was trying to listen for all these voices to see if I recognize anyone like Rose, but that sounded like Johans. Stay! Stay away! Oh no. Their screams fill the mansion. <laughs> she laughs all the while, a harsh, agonizing sound that goes on for what feels like forever. Until there is nothing but silence, her horrid smile, and pale hands reaching out to me. Calling. Beckoning. Pleading. I'm terrified. I really am, like I should be. QT? But I have never been one to truly stay afraid. I've long learned that fear will not get me anywhere. Cowering in a corner doesn't keep me safe, and it will not keep me alive. Not like rage does. I've learned to use this burning hate inside of me to survive. There is no difference now. Uh, stay away from me! Why? Why do you wish to leave? This is where you belong, my lord! Remember the blood we share? This is your home. Don't you remember? You promised to return. To stay. Man, the key to all this is finding out what that- what happened to the fiancé. Did he leave? Was he banished? Did he break off the engagement? Did, was he killed? Who did he make the promise to? Ah, oh, I have so many questions. Together with me. With us. With people no different from you. Maybe by the blood we share she means that they are not... noble? Because she's a servant. And Luke was raised on the streets. He only came into wealth later. Maybe that's what she means by the blood we share? Hmm. What is she talking about, Luke? What does she mean? I don't know, I'm busy theorizing, Hana. Don't listen to her, she lies. I promise no such thing to anyone. Hana, you're the one who bought this house. <laughs> this is your fault. How should I know what she's bobbling about? I never even wanted to be here in the first place. A terrible case of mistaken identity. That must be it, I'm quite sure of it. I mean, technically. I don't know this woman, this monster. Why would I say that to someone like her? In my entire lifetime, I've only made and kept sincere promises to a mere two people. Hannah Evans and Eleanor Chandler. No one else. The rest of those who claim I promise anything to them can go fuck themselves. Bloody hell. I may enjoy the company of women, but I am not an idiot to start spouting such nonsense to anyone. A line must be drawn! Especially if I am to keep myself alive. Yet she still goes on. Insists. Making me appear a liar in front of these people. Of course you still deny it. 
Have you truly forgotten? You haven't changed, I see. Still a deceiver. She's lying! You see, my love, nothing has changed. Still no difference, you and I. <laughs> Just like the rest of us. Just like every single soul in this putrid wreck. We've waited for so long. You can hear them, yes? Their pleas, their calls, their invitation. Come, my lord. The house seeks its master. She, the monster, reaches out again, her hands a gory, abhorrent sight, along with that smile spread across her face. My body's already moving on instinct, stumbling back one step at a time in a desperate bid to be away from her. Anything to put distance between me and this vile creature. No matter what she says, I am nothing like her. I need to get out of this house. Out of this country, preferably. Take Hana with me. We can start a new life out of this dreadful city. Start a family. There's nothing for us here. Her parents are long gone. Nothing to keep us tied to this place. Shroken has likely been taken by this woman, and he's not what binds me to this wretched city. I only need Hana. Sorry, Johans. We can leave, we can- Careful, Luke! My foot steps on something, sending me sliding on my back and flat on the floor. Beside me, a paper, familiar one flutters down. It's this thing again from the open house. Though it feels less like a gimmick and more like a threat, what with recent events. Must have fallen from one of those pe one of these peasants in the commotion earlier. For a moment, they appear conflicted to see it in my hands, but wisely keep their opinions to themselves. Leaving the damn thing to simply bear its grisly message for everyone in the room to see. Help me, help me, help me. Is this it? What they've been telling us? Why everything in my life has gone to shite? Because of some stupid old letter? An invitation, indeed. One I am not willing to accept. Not any time. From the top of the stairs, the creature moves again, drawing my attention back to her. Her gait remains slow and awkward as she walks forward, that smile never leaving her. But I don't. I won't give her the chance. I am not dying here. I certainly am not giving myself to a hideous creature like her, either. Adrenaline kicks in, and despite panicked gasps and worried glances from Daisy's friends, I pay them no mind as I reach for the main door, and... Without warning, it slams open, revealing not the mansion grounds like I am expecting. Oh, not this again. Before my mind can even compre comprehend what's happening, black tendrils have already coiled tightly around my limbs, dragging every person in the foyer into the room. None of us even get to scream when darkness completely envelops us upon the door's closing. Understand where your place is now, my love. You belong here. Is it so difficult to grasp? We've been waiting. 